Destiny Church. God is good, and all the time, now you're not in fine voice there yet, try it again. God is good, and all the time, hallelujah. And now, for something completely different. Contabernium, Contabernium, attend! Amen. Jesus. Woo! Woo! Well done, guys. Stay there. Stay there. A contubernium was the smallest unit of the Roman army, or consisted of eight men. Coincidentally, that's about the right size for a connect group. Now, that's strange, isn't it? They came along singing, singing a cadence song. Why? Because a cadence song meant they had the shoulders back, a head high, they could breathe and they would be able to talk and sing and walk for a long, long way without getting tired. Now imagine uh, somebody who's victorious and somebody who's defeated. You'll see a difference in some uh, PowerPoint, clients in a PowerPoint slides in a moment. But... The guys are going to demonstrate that for you now. So they're going to slump the shoulders forward, head held low, really defeated, and they're going to sing, We are the army of the Lord. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> now they're going to put shoulders back, head held high, and sing it again. We are the army of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's good. Okay. What a difference between walking in victory and walking in defeat. They were getting ready for battle. And so because of that, they had to aim high. You see, if we aim at nothing, we can hit it with remarkable accuracy. And most of us have done that at one time or another. So for the next eight weeks, sorry, you've got me for the next eight <laughs> weeks. There's always a downside, but you'll get over it, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, for eight weeks, we're going to look at the armor of God. Now, I want to tell you a little bit. I'm, I'm going to go through the whole series telling lots of stories because I love stories. And this is a true story. It started one day when I was upstairs in Pastor Jonathan's office. And he said to me, or asked me a question, what has the Lord been speaking to you about recently? Ever had that one? I've asked it many times myself. And I said, oh, well, he's been talking to me about the armor of God. And 
He said, oh, well, why don't you preach on it? I thought, okay, I could do that. So I started preparing a 20-minute sermon that ended up eight weeks long. But the thing is, it taught me an awful lot, and I hope it will teach you an awful lot about the armor, how it protects us, and how we can use it most effectively to be the men and women of God we want to be. Those eight guys that were standing behind me, you know, when you know you've got an army behind you, even a small one, a contubernium, something changes in your demeanor. And it gives you authority and power and a sense of purpose and, and vigor, really, to be able to carry on doing what you're doing. You know, just recently, we've uh, started doing the Alpha course, the main for adults, one for online and one for youth. And it's been really good. And we were looking at questions of life. And one of those, well, when we were looking at the questions, I remember the time has it come up now? Yes, this is it. Questions of life. And I saw this real ugly orangutan on a poster about 40 years ago in a Christian bookshop with its hands on its head with a look of abject despair saying, ah, oh, just when I knew the answers, they went and changed the questions. You know, and we've been there. So I want us to look at some questions of life, questions that may prove worthy of being life or death in some ways. And this is the first one. Next one. Oh, well, unfortunately, the graphic isn't working. It should. But I think you still get the idea. Usually the, the one on the, the left, right-hand side there is... So, guys, you've made up your mind already which one... <laughs> is the female. I would revise that if you want to live. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. The next one is the boat race. Which one won? You can see the one on your left is the winners. They're the ones that are hands up in the air. Yes, we did it. The ones on the right, they were defeated. Now, I prefer, I'll put my cards on the table. I prefer Oxford and they got beat. In this occasion. But anyway, the thing is, they both traveled the same route, they both expended the same amount of energy, but at the end of their time, after the race had finished, you saw the difference between victory and defeat. And knowing and having the armor of God and understanding its uses and being prepared is the difference for us between victory and defeat. Who likes good news? Yeah, yeah. So there's good news and there's bad news. So when I shout good news, I want you to go, yeah! When I shout bad news, boo. Are we ready for that? Try it. Good news. Yeah. Bad news. Good news. Yeah. A man was on a plane. Bad news. The engines failed. Good news. Yeah. He found a parachute. <laughs> bad news. The parachute wouldn't open. Good news. He saw a giant haystack. <laughs> Bad news. It had a pitchfork in it. Good news. He missed the pitchfork. Bad news. He missed the haystack. You see, the good news is that the Lord is the one who lifts our head. Psalm 3, verse 3 says that the Lord is the one who lifts our head high. Somebody once said to me, or I heard a preacher say, when you're sliding down the banister of life, make sure the splinters are pointing the other way. We've all been splintered. We've all hit the ground hard at times. And what do we do when life is tough? Well, we find out when life is tough that we have an enemy. And we, we've all got enemies, whether we like it or not. Winston Churchill said, you have enemies, good. That means you stood up for something sometime in your life. And as a Christian, we've stood up for Christ. And that makes a big difference. That means we have an enemy. And the enemy is called Satan. He's not called Satan because he's nice. He actually hates you. His raison d'etre, his reason for being, is to steal, kill, and destroy. 
You know, he's the one that hits you when you're down. He's the one that uh, will pull the rug out from underneath you when you think life is going smooth. But he's the enemy in lots of ways. I don't know if you've enjoyed reading all of the Bible. Now, it's a fair question, and you'll see why in a moment. You probably have a favorite Bible verse, passage, topic, theme that you enjoy reading and trying to apply. I'm sure we learned a lot when we did the series uh, of 40 Days in the Word. Remember that? That was awesome, wasn't it? Love the Word, learn the Word, live the Word. And we got it into us. You know, and people say, well, I would have done this, but. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the buts in life, you know, can be a little bit, oh, I would do this, but. I would serve, but. You, I don't have the time. I would read the Bible, but I get disturbed and I can't find the time. You know, all these buts can stop us. I was just reading Bear Grylls this morning in his, in his uh, devotional, uh, which was, uh, I think it was Soul Mind, uh, Soul Strength. And he was talking about the buts and talking about only having five minutes. Now, you know Kath very well. Yes? Has she ever asked you for a five-minute job? How long does it last? <laughs> but Bear Grylls, Bear Grylls says, you can do a lot in five minutes. Some people say, I can't do much. I've only got five minutes. But then there's the other people that say, I've got five minutes to spare. What can I do for you? What can I do in that time? What is available? What would you like me to do? There's a difference in how we look at it, our perspective. Now, the question I asked earlier about reading the Bible is, how many of you really enjoy reading the begats? You know the one which says, so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, had other children and begat so-and-so, begat so Yeah. Do you know, in, I think it's 1 Chronicles, the first nine chapters are all about begats. Nine chapters. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to find it really difficult going through the begats. And, and I was praying about it one day, and I felt the Lord saying, would you have felt different if your name was in one of those? You know, it would have made a big difference. But in Genesis 5, we see a genealogy. And the title of this series is either Get Your Orders or Get Your Lineage. Understand where you are and where you're going. And in Genesis 5, we read about 10 Hebrews uh, and their names. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Now, to consider those names, we ask the question, why? And Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So let's look at those names a little closer. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan, sorrow, dirge, or eulogy. Mahalel, the blessed God. Jared, shall come down. Enoch, teaching or commencement. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, lamentation, or means, or also means despairing. Noah, to bring relief, rest, or comfort. Last week, we had uh, a great message from Nadine, and she was talking about labels and about labels being attached to us. You know, well, there are lots of labels that are attached to us that aren't meant to be, as she said. Here are some instructions and labels on consumer goods that really didn't quite get there. Tesco's tiramisu dessert. The label printed on the bottom of the box said, do not turn upside down. On m and bread pudding, bread pudding, should I say, Product will be hot after heating. Boots, cough medicine for children. Children, do not drive car or operate <laughs> machinery. On a string of Christmas lights, can be used indoors or outdoors. 
And finally, night all sleep aid, warning may cause drowsiness. So, back to those names. When we look at them again, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. What do they represent? And if we look at what they represent, the phrase comes out differently. It says, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. That sounds an awful lot like the gospel to me and about Jesus coming to give us life. What a summary. And people asked, and why is that in the genealogy? Or why is it kind of hidden? But so that we can dig and dig deeper. And you know, we did the series Digging Deeper, and we continue to do the series Digging Deeper, and it helps us in that sense. And uh, Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So dig deeper. We need to know what we don't know at the moment. Remember when I teach guitar, I say to people from a course that I, I use that it's practice what you don't know, not what you know. So dig deeper into the things you don't know. There is an age-old European proverb that reads and says, age and treachery will always defeat youth and zeal. Right at the start of the series, we can recognize one thing. Satan is an ancient and old and extremely treacherous foe. And we are all youthful by comparison. And don't say, please don't say, I don't need to know about this. I've heard about spiritual warfare before and all that's involved. I don't need it. But um, Philippians 3, 1, we read, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. There are times when we all need to be reminded about God, his purposes, promises, and plan for our lives. I'd like to introduce you to a chap on my right, your left. He's called Ken. And you can see why he's called Ken, because literally on the back of his head, it's stamped Ken. And that was the reason we knew that. So his name, the name we've given him is Ken, Caius Evaristus Nikon. Doesn't mean the latest camera by Nikon by any means, but it's Ken is a man of high standing who is pleasing to God and victorious in battle. Now, isn't that good? We want to be victorious, pleasing to God. We want to be those people of high standing, not in our eyes, but in God's eyes. I don't know about you, but um, when you've maybe seen people or heard people who've been on call, you know, people like um, doctors, nurses, paramedics, police, air sea rescue, coast guards, that kind of thing. When, when, when they're on call, they're ready for action at any time any time, day or night. And they remember that we're in a struggle. And we're in a struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the rulers of the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But God has given us his armor so that we can be ready for action. You know, over the, over the eight weeks, I'm going to share some stories about life for me a little bit in the army, because I was in the army for five years, but a lot more, about 25 years service in the fire service and the things that happened. And I've seen people uh, go, used to call them beds uh, when you were on the fire station. They were changed to recovery areas. Um, people didn't like to think that we were sleeping when we were on duty. But anyway, so ready for anything. And I've seen people get up, and instead of putting the jumper on the head, they pulled it through their legs, and so many different things. They, they get up the wrong way, but then they get practiced and trained in what to do, how to set the gear out. And they could be out the door from an alarm going off with inside 30 to 60 seconds, fully alert, doing what needed to be done. And we need to be dressed the same way so that we can have the armor, and obviously, it's spiritual armor we're looking at, and 
to be dressed in it, ready for action. I attended a conference uh, quite some time ago. It was uh, through the God Channel up in Scotland in Edinburgh, and it was called the Braveheart Conference. Quite an original name. Anyway, so up there, there was this guy, and he was dressed in Highland regalia from top to toe. And uh, the guy that was taking the conference had him stand on a, a, a table, and he said, what do you want to say? And he just stood there, put his arm in the air, and said, it's time for war! Now, Mel Gibson couldn't have done it better, I'm sure. But anyway, what time is it? And that was it. That was his answer. It couldn't have been so more impacting. Time for war. You know, we need to recognize that it's time to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. It's time to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. It's time to reclaim your family. It's time to reclaim your friends. It's time to get the job God has for you. It's time that your dreams were fulfilled. It's time that you have intimacy with Jesus in a way you've never had it before. It's time to do the work of God. It's time to fight for what we believe. It's time to stand up and be right in an unrighteous world. I don't know about you, but do you wait well? Now, I remember a little while Pastor Jonathan um, spoke about this when he talked about being in a supermarket queue. Are you one of those people that stand in the queue and look along and think, their basket's not as big as mine, I'll go with that one. But then you missed all the other things they had underneath, so it takes longer to get through. You know, have you done that? Yeah, I have, I have as well. My wife is a master at it. <laughs> she will look down to the nth degree and work out which one was going to be the right one. And then, well, I didn't know that was there, otherwise I wouldn't have chosen. Anyway, there we go. But the time is what? What time is it? Time for war. But you know, when you're waiting in the queue, what do you do? Do you get grumped? Can we use that five-minute time for something else? I remember somebody said, maybe you should do what waiters do when they wait. They serve. They serve. Do you have a servant heart? Do you, display, do you display godly attributes? Do you have a ministry of encouragement? How is your zeal for the Lord? Is it on fire? Is it rising? Is it ascending? Well, over these eight weeks, as we put on the full armor of God, pray that will be the case. Reading Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, this is the passage we know about the armor of God. Uh, but we're going to read the J.B. Phillips translation with a slight revision that I've put in and changed things around just slightly, but it still maintains the original thought. Be strong, not in yourselves, but in the Lord, in the power of his boundless resource. Put on God's complete armor so that you can successfully resist all the devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against any physical enemy, it is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. Therefore, you must wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power and that even when you have fought to a standstill, you may still stand your ground. Take your stand then with truth as your belt Righteousness, your breastplate, the gospel of peace firmly on your feet. Be sure to take faith as your shield, for it can quench every burning missile the enemy hurls against you. Salvation as your helmet and in your hand the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. Above all, pray at all times with every kind of spiritual prayer, keeping alert and persistent as you pray for all Christ's men and women. So as we look at Ken over the next eight weeks, we'll look at his armor and we'll see what the armor represents, both spiritually but also practically, and we'll see what we can get from that. And so we use a legionary's 
armor because that was the armor at the time when Paul was around and it was also probably the armor that the uh, soldiers would have had as they would, would have wore that when maybe they were, they were either side and Paul was chained to them. So I want to reef, briefly outline the, uh, the pieces. If I don't think you can get that. That's it. Okay. So starting at the top, we've got the helmet or galea. And uh, we'll go into great detail as to what it is used for in various ways and what's been built into it. And then we've got the uh, breastplate, which is a lorica segmentata. Then we've got the sword, the gladius, the belt, which is a kingulum. And then sandals, caligae, and the shield, scutum. Now, they're the main six pieces of the armor of God. There are three other pieces on there that aren't mentioned in that passage. And those you can see are the fiery dart, which is the plumda, plumbata, a dagger he would wear uh, called a pugio, and then the javelin at the top called a pelum. And we'll look at each of those and see what we can get from them. Now, with regards... People often talk about the fiery darts. I don't know if you can see this really well, but this is what a fiery dart would look like. It has its flights there, fletchings. It has the arrowhead there. It has a, a metal a weight on there. And then it would be dipped in some hot oil, ignited. And then they would probably just throw it. And it wouldn't go very far. But they did have slings that would enable it to go further. So it could maybe go 30 to 50 meters. But each uh, legionary would have probably five of these attached to the inside of his shield. And uh, they would start off throwing the javelin because it couldn't be thrown as far as the fiery dart. And then from the javelin, they would go on to this. And you've got to realize it was a big army and so the guys facing the Romans, they would be getting peppered with javelins and with fiery darts. So, for anybody that wants to enlist. <sighs> so, priority of recruitment. And so it's Something to look at. For Israel, it was their lineage. It was important for them that they could prove who they came from in the, the order of uh, Israel. And as such, they could be then eligible to serve in the, their forces. And you, you all know the story of Gideon, so I won't press the, the point. But basically, Gideon started off with a lot of men and ended up with a lot less men. Because that's what God wanted him to do. But to put the, the story in historical context, um, the siege of Troy took place in about 1190 BC. 40 years later, 1150 BC, was when we have the story of Gideon. So that kind of gives it a historical context. And during that time, Israel were defeated by the Midianites. Time and time and time again. This went on for seven years. And that's why uh, on one of them, you'll probably have the next slide, which shows that uh, you see Gideon in a wine press. Hopefully. Amen. Yes, we got there. Thank you. Well done, tech team. And then the Lord says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. With a rice flail, beating the wheat, the barley, whatever it was. God is with you, mighty warrior. And he says, well, I'm the least in the clan. You know, I'm a nobody. Ever said that? I'm a nobody. I'm worthless. I'm not worth anything. I'm no good for anybody. You know, that's the thinking that needs to be changed. And God will help us change it as we put on his armor and as we understand it. And the Lord says to him, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So the Lord commissions Gideon to go and fight the Midianites. And they were all chosen from the line of Israel, the line of Jacob. They weren't Midianites, they weren't Amorites, they weren't Hittites, they weren't Hivites, Jebusites, Gegashites, 
they were Israelites, and that was their priority for recruitment. Going quickly on to the recruitment for Rome, it was their legislation. And with legislation, they had to fulfill certain legislative requirements. They had to be a Roman citizen. Now, the interesting thing about being a Roman citizen, uh, it could be quite complex. Usually, it meant you had to be of noble birth. Well, that's me out straight away. I don't know about you. Uh, but there is another kind of noble birth. Uh, you could receive citizenship through outstanding service. And that was mainly for those who weren't in the main army but were auxiliaries, a bit like territorial army today. And if they served outstandingly for 20 to 25 years, they could possibly be given Roman citizenship. You could buy it. You could buy Roman citizenship. But the main criteria as well was that the Roman citizen had to be at least five foot four inches tall. Anyone five foot three and less? Now, don't, don't worry about this, ladies, because it was only men. You know, men were it. No ladies allowed. A bit like golf. Gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. That's what somebody once said. But anyway, but here we go. So they had to have physical strength and physical stamina. You know, be of high moral character. In other words, not a lawbreaker or not be caught being a lawbreaker. And they, they had to be, this is it, single. So if you were married and you wanted to join up, you could get a quick divorce. That's the way they worked. But on the physical side of things, you know, they had to be really strong. I remember when I, um, I went for an interview for the fire service. And they said, right, okay, what you need to do now is you need to do the part of the physical exam. I said, okay. Now, I hadn't been long left the, the army, so I was fairly fit. And they said, right, what you need to do is carry this 12-stone man 100 yards in less than a minute. I said, okay, I can do that. Yeah, no problem. Till I saw the man. You know the orangutan? Uh, when I put him over my shoulders, his feet and his hands were dragging along the ground. I couldn't believe how tall he was. And so I staggered up and down, but I managed to do it anyway, but that was it. But you know, there was times in the Roman army when things could be eased, depending on the situation. If there needed to be uh, more recruits, well, the age limit was kind of relaxed a little bit. Because you had to be between 17 and 49. But then, if there was a problem and they needed more soldiers, they would increase that. And then, the one thing that the Roman legionary had to do was take the sacramentum. That was an oath. Uh, an oath to the boss, as it were. The general. And the general, his life, you know, was paramount. What he said went. And in, Roman, in the Roman mind, the idea was that a soldier was a tool. He was a machine. Yes, they possessed dignity and honor, but as far as the, the hierarchy were concerned, they were something to be used and disregarded. And so many people didn't last long or survive long in the Roman army. And if they did anything wrong, well, the punishment in some cases were they could be flogged, given poor food to eat, docked their pay, then maybe demoted, possibly decimated, executed, or disbanded. Now, what do I mean by decimated? That's where we get uh, part of our decimal system from as well. If a man committed a crime that was so bad, what they would do is they would get the, uh, the whole legion out, or for their, 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 uh, their guys. And there would probably be in about 80 of them, maybe two, two lots of 80. We'll have a look at that in a little while. But with those two lots of 80, every 10th man would be executed. So even on decimation alone, you could lose a lot of men. But that was their legislation. And they had to perform every day to an exacting standard of, of work and routine. And then there's a priority of recruitment in God's army. Take a different student. Jesus was tested by an expert in the law when he was asked this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So to be a soldier in the army of God, it's very simple. Are you born again? Not where were you born? Was it a posh place or not? But are you born again? Whether your family are Christians doesn't make any difference. What matters is, was it your decision to come to Christ? See, going to church was another thing as well. It doesn't make you a Christian by going to church any more than it makes you a doctor by visiting the hospital. Age doesn't matter as long as you are capable of making an informed decision for Christ. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Hallelujah. Doing kind deeds won't save you. And you can't buy your way into heaven. What's the point? The pavement's gold. You know, so you can't give enough to buy yourself into heaven. It's about love. Love for God and love for others. And that's the important thing. Profile for victory. You've probably heard some people's, uh, some pe preachers in the past talk about um, best way to put it. God's not worried about your ability. He just wants your availability. We'll have a look at that. At the DC here, we have a lot of torches. And some of them are designated for specific use only. Like we have a, a box on, in the uh, main foyer that is the firebox. And in there we have some torches just ready for when there's a fire alarm goes off. We can grab the torches and we use them. Now the thing is with those torches, they have to be checked at least once a month to make sure that they're okay. Because if they're kept in a nice warm environment and they're not checked for ages, then the battery acid can leak and the, the, the torches become defective. So, it's the same with us, in a sense. We weren't created to stay in a safe, warm environment. We were created, yes, to be available for use, but wherever we're needed. And uh, Galatians 6.10 says, whenever we have the opportunity, we have to do what is good. And then James 2.14, what, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? We need to look for the small tasks in life and do them with a largeness of heart. A farmer said, the hardest thing about milking cows is that they don't stay milked. The hardest thing about hoovering the carpet here is that it doesn't stay clean. The hardest thing about washing, washing up is that the dishes pile up and have to be washed. You know, we can go on and look at different things, but there are so many things that need to be done. And that's why, you know, Kath comes along and says, what a five-minute job. And maybe we can think of that five minute a little bit differently now and say, what can I do in that five minutes that I, you know, I can give you the time for that. You know, somebody said, volunteers don't get paid because they're worthless. It's because they are priceless. Our volunteers are priceless. They have a heart for the work. They have a work for the, heart for the ministry. And they have a heart to serve the leadership and to serve the Lord. Indira Gandhi said, my grandfather once told me that there are two kinds of people those who do the work and those who get the credit. She said, he said, try to be in the first group. There's less competition there. Some, work, some people work to be rewarded, but really the reward is in the service itself. I'm doing this to the glory of God for his honor and, and I'll do what I can. You know, but sadly, some people, they want to do less they want more time to do it and get paid even more for not doing it. 
It's true. The only place where success comes before work is in a dictionary. Now, if you really want freedom, you really want freedom, well, what you need to do is tell your boss what you really think of him, and his voice will set you free. You see, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. So that's availability, but ability. And as I say, you've heard many pre preachers say, we don't need ability, we just need availability. But then if we think about uh, shape, spiritual gifts, heart for work, abilities. Oh, there it is, natural talents, abilities, personality and experiences. We need to live a life of purpose and meaning. Meaning. When I joined the fire brigade, I went to training school at Durham, and I was there for just over 12 weeks, it was. And I, I knew what to expect, because I'd obviously gone through five years of, of uh, army life and had a good general idea. But what I didn't know at the time was that one of the instructors, see, I was in the Royal Engineers, and one of the instructors was an ex-Royal Engineer. And it was nightmare. It would be all the time, they would set a task, but then they would pull something out so it made it more difficult. And for the Royal Engineers, the, uh, one of the mottos, and we'll look at mottos in a moment, but one of them was ubique, which means everywhere. But there was an unofficial motto for the Royal Engineers, and it was improvise. And all I ever got from this sub officer at the training school was improvise, Kresna, improvise. No matter what there was, you had to find a solution and find it quick because life depended on it. So looking at some of the, the service mottos. Now, you might be two bar berries there. I've only ever worn one of them, and it's the bottom one. I would have liked to have worn the top one, but I don't think I'd have managed it with the SAS. But uh, so the first one, if you go back to the previous one, different cap badges. Does that sound familiar to something we heard last week? Different labels? They were signifying different things. SES and the, uh, the motto of the SES is, who dares wins? Motto of the Royal Engineers, that's the bottom uh, cap. And that was when I said ubique, but the main one was where duty and glory lead. Going back to the, uh, the, them there, you can see them, Royal Army Medical Corps, faithful in adversity, parachute regiment, ready for anything. Sounds a bit like the torches again, doesn't it? Royal Corps of Signals, swift and sure. And then down the rifles, swift and bold. Royal Navy, if you wish for peace, prepare for war. Special boat service by strength and guile. You didn't know Pat got a mention there, did you really? But there we are. And then the Royal Air Force, through adversity to the stars. Then we have our own church motto, Maxim. Transforming lives through audacious, audacious faith, inspiring hope and extravagant love. But I kind of tried to think of those army mottos and the one we use at DC to, to produce this. If you wish for peace, then prepare for war. We are at war with Satan, whether we like it or not. When you become a Christian, you are automatically on his hit list. Your call is to serve everywhere. It will require your utmost daring and deepest endeavor. Press on through adversity, always looking unto Jesus, and you will reach your goal. For those who love will win, because love never fails. Life tests us. There's no doubt about that. Life makes us stronger or makes some people weaker by how they handle things. But the thing is, no matter what we're going through, we know that the Lord is there for us, looking for us. Psalm 33 says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind from his dwelling place. He watches all who live on earth. Gideon's men didn't know what they were facing, going back to Gideon. But they were facing a test, and that was how they drank water. And that was part of their ability. 
because they'd been seasoned for war. And so they would kneel down and they would just lap it, but they would still be looking around rather than sinking their head into the water and taking deep gulps. Quickly moving on to processing the data. There's a cost involved in serving the Lord. When I went to the army recruitment office, I wanted to, to join up. I wanted an adventure. And that's one of the reasons that led me into the army, but also led me to, to Christ. Because when I joined the army, I realized that, well, okay, I was only 16 at the time, um, but I was going to serve probably somewhere between uh, 9 and 12 years. But the problem was, what happens if there's a war? I might have to go to war, and I wasn't too happy about that. But it was an adventure to get there. It wasn't an adventure to stay there. I had to look at reality. And I realized, well, I would do it because it was my duty, but it wasn't something I particularly wanted to do. And in the process of learning about Christ and all, all that was involved there, I had to learn certain things. But in the army, it was a process. And that process meant there was a commitment. I had to commit. And the way I could only commit was to sign the dotted line. But I had to get permission of my parents because I was only 16, not 18. Anyway, that was, that was one thing. But he said to me, he, he explained all the graphic details of the nice places he'd been to and the exciting adventures he'd had. He never once mentioned any wars or anything like that. It all sounded good, so that was it. But he did say, when you join, life will never be the same. And it wasn't. You know, some people say, oh, I'd love to do devotion in the morning, but I'm not a morning person. Yeah? I wasn't a morning person until I joined the army. I became one. It's what we want to do. So it was a decision I had to make. That was the cost known for me. But the cost shown is the same for being a Christian. There is a cost in following Christ. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's the cost. Seeking Jesus first. Living for Jesus. Your life will never be the same. Only you can make the decision. People, when I spoke to them, saying, well, you know, you're a Christian, but how do you... Because they used to talk about this word, saved. And I used to say, how do you know when you're saved? And they said, you just know. And it was an interesting one, but it was one I had difficulty with for quite a while. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That means salvation. So, looking at our priority for recruitment, legislation for the Romans, the lineage for the Israelites, and love. Love for a Christian. Paul had a great pedigree. He was, his lineage was a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin. His legislation, he was a Roman citizen. Law, he was a Pharisee. Legalistic righteousness, he was faultless. He was all those things and more. Just want to quickly share a couple of other things and then we're done. I'm sorry, I'm past my time. Um, but I feel it's important to share this last part. Do you want to live a fruitful life? I'm sure you do. Do you want to serve the Lord to the best of your ability? C.T. Studd was considered England's most outstanding cricketer many, many years ago. Uh, but he uh, went with six other guys called, the, they became the known as the Cambridge Seven, and they ded uh, dedicated their life to foreign missionary service. And one of his well-known quotes is, if Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. If Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. There's a cost when you become a soldier, and there is a sacrifice. And when you list in God's army, that changes everything. And quickly, preference and posting. I'll just brush over these very, very quickly. The first one is, um, you want me to serve how? Well, on the graphic, you may see something like uh, hoovering, PA, PA, worship. You get the idea. And all I'm going to say on that one is, when God looked at David, what did he see? A shepherd boy, we saw more than that. He saw 
He saw a soldier. He saw a shepherd. He saw a musician. He saw a father, a husband, a king. There is many things inside of each of us that God sees and wants to bring out so that you can enrich the body of Christ. Do you want me to serve where? Now, sometimes it's foreign fields. Sometimes it's just in the ministry in the church. I just want to share this one in closing. Quite a lot of years ago, Chris and I were asked to go and help set up a church in Cramlington. Cramlington was an 80, 85 mile round trip, trip from where we lived in Hartlepool. And we did the journey four times each week, twice on a Sunday and then on a Tuesday and a Friday. And that was it. During winter, it started snowing heavy and we had to set up about an hour, an hour and a half earlier than we normally would. And uh, we got there. And then later on, one, one of the guys at the church said, I want to share something with you. I thought, uh oh, am I in trouble? Because when some people say that, you're not too sure which way it's going to go. But he said, I, I want to apologize. He said, um, we looked outside the window this morning and saw the snow on the ground. And he said, we weren't going to come. He said, we thought it was too dodgy to come because of the snow and the ice. But anyway, we decided we would come. He says, and then we got to the car park and we saw your car there. And he said, it put it into perspective. I was only going to be traveling half a mile in the car and you were way, way, way over that. You want me to serve? We need to be available to serve where God wants us to serve. There is a cost and commitment. Do you get discouraged? I like what Mother Teresa said. No, I don't become discouraged. God has not called me to a ministry of success. He has called me to a ministry of mercy. Next week, we'll look at the belt of truth. But I want you to do one thing about the belt of truth, if you would take part in it. And that's come next week with an outlandish belt that you have. And what we would like to do is we would like, to, um, if you come wearing a really flash belt, and then we're going to have a little bit of a competition. Probably five people will be chosen. Um, and the, uh, the pe person that's choosing them won't be known to anybody here. He won't, 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 he won't be aware of who it is who's doing the cho choosing. And then there'll be five up here. And then it will be by, um, shall we say, audience vote. You can vote for the one who you think's got the perfect belt. And then at the end of it, there'll be a little prize for them. And each week for the six weeks of the, uh, the different pieces of armor, we'll, we'll do the same thing on those. So that's for next week. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you that I stand before you today and declare, prima que prius, my first thing above all others is that I am yours forever. May that be our prayer, Lord. May we endeavor to be good soldiers of Christ and offer our abilities and availability for the glory and purposes of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to develop a servant's heart that brings joy to you and paves the way for true life and living. Thank you, Lord. Ask this in your precious name. Amen.